All right, good afternoon. Let's get started. Um, so let me let me finish the the um, notion of video compression that we were talking about in the last lecture, right? Um, do you have any questions about what we covered so far? So I figured I'll, I'll use the notion of animation to explain sort of what we are trying to achieve and why it's so hard to uh, do the, the compression, right? So animation, without going into the detail, right? The simple, in the simple form, you create, kind of create some sort of object, right? And the more complex the object is, the more re realistic it looks and all those things. But in the simple form, you take some object, and if you want to animate, you kind of figure out where this object would be at different points in time. So if you're going to do a 30 frames per second, you decide where it will be in the 1 30th of a second, next 1 30th of a second, and, and so on, using some sort of a, uh, some calculation, right? So if you're, if you're looking at a bouncing ball, you have a notion of the ball high, you know, the, the weight of the ball and the gravity and all those things to decide where this thing should be, right? So you may decide that this ball starts off here and one second it's going to be here, right? So you have to have some kind of equation which figures out that it's going to say, say let's take this trajectory, right? So you say in the frame one it'll be this, frame two this will be this, the frame three will be this, this and so on and so forth, right? And if you play it at the rate that you, you are looking for, it looks like it's moving, even though it's, it's going here. So I think I got the Wikipedia. So you see those little sequences. And when they're played at a certain rate, it looks like the ball is bouncing, right? There are, there are more issues. I mean, they make the ball kind of squish and all those things, ignore those aspects, right? So what you're trying to do is the, the compression form we don't know that there's object, right? We don't know what this trajectory and all those things. We would like to look at these individual frames and sort of predict what is happening, right? So then we could basically say, draw this one, and the next one is a simple translation from here to here. Even though in the real uh, animation case, it's not a simple like linear transformation, it's actually going through some sort of a more complex equation, right? So we would like to say from here, the next one should be you know, this far from here, and take this one, go from here, go from here, and so on and so forth, right? So I take the first one, and then I kind of try to predict this stuff, right? If that's all I have to do, it's far trivial. The real case is we are looking at a real scene where there's a more complex object, not a circle kind of thing. So I need to figure out what is the object in a, in a, in a, in a frame, right? So if you, if you look at this scene, I'm standing here, I'm, I'm more complex than a, than a round ball. So you have to figure out where my object is, and you have to figure out where I would have, I would have moved, right? So you're trying to figure out what these things are on a complex object which are moving in different ways, in, in completely unpredictable uh, ways, right? So it could be like saying something very, uh, very close to, to you, it could be something very far. So you're trying to figure out how, what, what this is. The, the, if you can do something about it, you get good compression. If you can figure out what, how these motions were, you can get good compression. If you can't, then you, you don't get any compression, right? So the goal is, you have to, there, there are some algorithms which go through the scene. So if you have an image, I have no idea what, what, what objects are and what they're moving. So I'm gonna start from this image. I'm gonna look at, let's say, um, so the, I have the target and the reference, right? And if you take the reference as the previous one and the target as the current one, if you're taking these two frames, I have to go through here, right, at, at some, in some way, sweep through this stuff. If it's a simple animation like this, I'm gonna look at all the objects which are here and see where they moved over here. Since I have no notion of objects and stuff, I'm going to look at each one of these things, right? So I'm gonna take this particular square and I'm going to see where the square might have moved, right? And I'm gonna restrict, so I can make it as complex and search for this object throughout this stuff, right? And I can search for whether this, this particular, uh, this whatever this rectangle was, happens to be anywhere on the screen. And the more I look, right, I, I can capture more of the compression, uh, more of the movements, but the, com the, calculate, the computational effect goes way high. Right? So I don't, I cannot afford to look through all of the stuff, so I'm kind of restricting it to say, I suspect that movements would have moved it from here to here. If I can't find it within the range, then something is wrong, right? Otherwise, I'm gonna do the stuff. So I'm gonna take each one of these squares, and I'm gonna see where it might have moved, right? So the, the processing gets higher and higher because this is, uh, if I take 1920 by 1080, 
So I have a certain number of blocks here, and I have to see for each block, I have to look in this bigger range, right? And I have to do it 30 frames per second, so the amount of computation goes way high, right? But I have to try to do that because if I can, if I can find it, then then it's it's very good. I'll show some uh, illustrations of how how it can help, right? But the sky is the limit in terms of how complex you want to be, right? If you have all the time in the world, you can you may analyze this frame and this frame and, and figure out what what has to happen, and you go from there, right? And we'll see more complex like in MPEG4 and all those things are. Are, are more complex in terms of what they look for, not just blocks, but objects and stuff, but essentially that's the idea, right? And how many of you like started doing the projects in terms of like trying to compress and all those things, right? You may notice that it's, it's extremely slow, right? So uh, for example, this, this lecture, I moved from my MacBook to a PowerBook uh, for transcoding, right? So 50 minute lecture, I started on, on a Monday afternoon, like four o'clock, Right? I had to stop it right now because it still needed 4,435 more minutes right? to transcode it using, so on my, on my laptop it takes like 15 hours, right? So I figured it, it, this is like an older machine, it probably take like 30 hours or so, but I don't know what, what this, uh, I, didn't, I didn't do the math to figure what, what how many hours it is, but I can't afford to let it go that long, right? It's been going on for almost like 40, 40, 44 hours or so, right? And it's taking all that much time because it's essentially trying to figure out all this, this stuff, right? This is kind of boring, not too complex, and if you, if you see the equations and stuff, they're very simple. We're not trying to do anything pr pretty complex because even the simple stuff, the amount of data you're, you're dealing with is massive, right? And the, and the good part is, the, all the time you spend doing this is worth it because once you compress it, the decompressor is pretty trivial. All it has to do is it gets this this one and it, and it gets something which says, okay, in the next frame, just take whatever the, 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 the circle is and then plot it here, right? So I have to render a new one here and that's all I have to do, right? So you do all the processing on the compression side. Decompression is simple because all it has is object and the motion. Does that make sense? So you start us trying to go back from these, these frames, trying to figure out what really caused these things to happen, except you don't even know what the objects are. And to make life interesting, it may happen that the, the two frames may not be related. So if you, in this case, it's highly unlikely that suddenly something is going to change. But if you're, say, watching a TV or something, you may see, uh, you're watching a game, you may see a certain angle, and you may see that future frames are all predicting from the previous one, like if you're watching a football or something. The next particular scene, maybe from a completely different angle, right? So these two may not be related at all, then you based, end up trying to figure out the similarity, and at some point you realize that these two are completely dissimilar, so you have to go back, right? So you, you also have to keep that in mind. You want to keep trying to find out what happened, but you can't afford to do it forever, because it may happen that these two are completely unrelated, right? Either because they are completely unrelated, or they're slightly enough unrelated that you can't really tell, right? So think of think of your, again, a football game or something, right? So it might have moved a camera angle from, say, from here to this part of the state, the, of the of the state, if you think of this as the field. So it may still look like it's all green, it may still look like there's you know, grass and all those things, but it's a completely different part of the, of the thing, so things change enough that, um, so it's, most of the, you can't use like simple tri tricks to get around from this, right? So you, you need lots of processing. Right, so, so that's, that's the deal, right? And the, to, to make, so they, they, the, all the standards we're talking about only tell you all these processes. They don't say what they have to do, right? So you can build a compressor which doesn't do any of this motion detection stuff. It'll be awful, but it'll still be and, you know, whatever, the, whatever compression you're, you're talking about, MPEG-4 or MPEG-2 or whatever, it'll be awful, it'll still be MPEG-2 compliant, right? And that's to make sure that you, know, you, don't, you don't say what exactly has to happen. So you take a, s a certain scene, you, you can use different compressors and you get different objects, different compression, different what have you, but they all look the same because they have to decode the same, right? So, so th that's the problem. So we're trying to figure out, so as a first cut, we're trying to look at it as block-based because finding out objects and stuff is, is way more complicated, especially in, at the earliest form of this technology. So you're trying to look at some block and you're trying to see where this block might have gone, right? So, so the, the goal is to say, I take this block, let's assume I have to look into this big area, right? 
So I want to figure out, I want to place this block over here, right? And do some sort of measure to see how similar the contents underneath it and this one are, right? Some sort of a met metric. And one of the metrics is the mean absolute difference, which tells you, which compares these two blocks to figure out what's the difference. And there are other ones described in the book, right? So you, you want to find something which can compare these blocks. And hopefully they'll give you a number which says something about how, how good they are. So you figure out what this value is. Then let's say you shift it one pixel this way. You do this measure. You pick, move it one way, do this measure. You pick it one way, do this measure, right? So you don't want this, this metric to be pretty complex because for each of those iterations, you have to take this block, whatever the block size is, and you have to do this comparison. And if you look at this, the, the equation for the um, mat, right? You're doing a bunch of subtractions and, um, and additions, right? But if you take an eight by eight block, so you're, you're doing that many operations for, per, per, per block, right? So, um, so that's the thing. So essentially what you're trying to do is you, you do this stuff to other things and then find out the, the ones with the least amount of the differences. And then you kind of say, if, if that happens to be here, then you assume that this particular block moved over from here to here because that's the, the lowest amount of stuff. So you're trying to generate motion vector from something from here to here, right? So there's something magical about math. So you don't have to remember what math is, but you need some kind of metric which lets you compare two matrices and see how close they are, right? And that, that's, the, that's the goal. It gives you a number that you can use to compare two of these things. So there's a number of different ways of searching this stuff. And again, it depends on your encoder to choose the right one, right? Sequentially, is what I was kind of explaining here, where you take this, the, the, the P region, the, the region which you, you want to compare, and look at every pixel, right? So you, you started starting from pixel zero, pixel one, pixel two, pixel three, and so on, and then you move one, <coughs> um, one row down, two row down, three row down, all the way across, right? So this way you'll find the, the minimum of this whole set, right? And it's also the most uh, computation intensive, right? So if you think of the uh, subtraction, absolute value, and addition, um, the, the book goes a little bit more detail. But essentially, the, the complexity is O of P squared, N squared. And so th that's, that's pretty expensive. So you're essentially doing it on a, 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 for every pixel, right? So there are other optimizations you can do. One is the is a logarithmic uh, search, which is sort of like a um, binary search, right? So rather than doing everywhere, you kind of like choose some points and you try to see which one seems closer and then use that as a neighborhood and then, and then go from there, right? It's very similar to the binary search, except it's in 2D. So you assume that if you, if you take this area and you are trying to match, match something of this spot, right? You assume that, let's say you, you chose these four areas, right? And you do the mat at those regions. If the mat at, at this region appears to be the smallest, then you assume that the correct answer is somewhere along this area. Right? It may, may, not, may not be true, but in general, you assume it's true. So then you start, you know, so start going from somewhere here, and then you do the same thing. You, you split this area into four, and then you try to find out where they are. So um, the book has illustration. So, so essentially, uh, you, you take this, the one is the first, first round of, of object. So rather than going through every one of these pixels, you choose those one points and find out where the minimum is. It turns out to be that point, right? That, that dark and one. Then you, the next iteration, you choose a smaller rectangle around that one, right? And, and you're trying to find where it is, and so on and so forth. And essentially, you find find this stuff. So it, it goes as a as a kind of a, a binary search, a kind of search. And again, it, it so if you take an algorithm course, you probably can come up with much more complex, much more uh, realistic algor uh, algorithms for doing this. But the, but the Reality is you have to do lots and lots of these stuff, right? So, so the code size and the time to do it is, is a lot more important than anything, right? Because you have to, for every frame, you have to do this for every other frame. And as you'll see, the, the, the complexity is you may not be able to do, you may not have to do it just with the past frame. Good compression would actually go like certain number of frames forward and backwards, right? And that's what MPEG and all, MPEG 2 and 4 and all will do, which is essentially, if you have a set of frames, 
In the simple case, we can look at the previous one to figure out what the, what the next one is. That's the forward predictor. But in, in more realistic cases, if you can analyze a whole bunch of these frames, you may find out that this frames and this frame are related to this and this frame, right? And this is related to something over here, uh, and, and this is related to here or something like that, right? So think of if you think about movie and stuff, you know, you, you, you have two cameras going back and forth. So you want the prediction to go further as far as, as possible. You don't want to go to infinity, but you, you maybe have to go through this a lot, right? Because that's what happens in real life. You know, you have these different scenes kind of glued together. So you want to do as many computations as possible. Each one of these frames is big as 1920 by 1080 kind of thing. So you want to be able to do this uh, lots, lots and lots. So that's, that's the challenge you're trying to do, right? And the, and the last approach that, that the book describes is the hierarchical approach, which is sort of like, uh, again, like a binary search. Essentially what you do is you don't sample the image, right? The idea here is you take this big image, which is over there, and you're trying to match something. So you let's say you, you don't sample it by two, which is you divide all sides by two. So you have a far smaller image, right? Then you try to find out, and you of course you have to don't sample your block two. Then you try to see where that block matches here, right? So if you do a double down sample it twice, and if you have a eight by eight matrix that you're trying to do, right? So essentially you can you can do a two by two matrix. That you change your, the 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 reference one to a two by two uh, matrix, and you made your whole image to be small. Then your number of computations become smaller because you're trying to match on this one. So again, whichever region you see a match, then you go back to a higher level and then start from there to look around and then go back, right? So it, it's a sort of the same as what you did with the logarithmic stuff, except you do this down sampling and you're searching. So the idea here is if it, if it tends to match at some point here, that will map into a four by four region over here, right? And then it, it gets mapped to higher and higher region. So hopefully that'll help me find, find these things faster, right? And again, you can think of like other ways to do this stuff, and, and, and the key here is th these things should be fa uh, fast. So the um, number of operations per second for a 720 by 480, which is the DVD uh, size, 30 frames per second. So if you have the P equals 15 or, or 7, it tells you how many operations it has to do, right? Um, so the sequential search, so ignore if you ignore the billion part, right? So with the sequential search, you go, you have to do 29.89, but with the 3D hierarchical, you, you bring it down to 0.51, right? So it makes a big difference in terms of how well, how, how much computation you have to do. But again, the, the catch is, there may be cases where these things miss, miss those stuff. If the, the movement is subtle enough, you might be able to see what happened, right? And again, uh, for, if you come with your new, new codex, you're free to do whatever you want. You're free to do however you find this stuff. All you have to find is at, at which block moved from one to the other to encode, right? So again, um, I found some image on the web to see how, how these things kind of pan out. Right? So uh, dvdhq.info had, had this one super grainy uh, picture, right? So essentially, if, you, if I go back and forth, right? You see the, the, the between these two frames, right? I'm going back and forth, right? The car kind of moved, people kind of walked, people kind of moved a certain way, right? The buildings hopefully didn't move because the camera was not panning, right? The camera is looking at some one angle. So, so what you're trying to do is, you have JPEG artifacts and stuff on the things. So if you look at the column, right? If you look at the, the pillar on the, over here, right? The pillar did not move, but you see the JPEG artifact making it uh, look like it's kind of moving because the picture looks different, right? Um, so hopefully if you can figure those out, right? All you have to do is, I would have to encode something about this person, something about this car, something about this person, and something about areas that this car, once it moved, would be visible now, and something about areas that used to be visible, not visible anymore because the car moved, right? So um, that's what I'm trying to find out. So if I can find that, all I have to encode is sort of the action happening around here. The rest of the scene, nothing is happening, so that I don't have to send transmit anything, right? 
So again, to show what the macro blocks are, so you essentially, you, you know, for this particular scene, there are that many macro blocks, you have to look at each one of them. So you look at, you look at this, and you're trying to look at where the corresponding one on the next frame, and trying to see where they matched, right? And if you look at visually, there's not much detail. So, you know, you may, may not be good all the time, and that's why the difference in vector comes. So to, to explain this stuff, they took some blocks, right? They took the A block, Nothing should change because the, the, the building did not move. Uh, but you see over here, things change because there's part building and the part car, right? You may be able to see the car. So when the car moves, you see something changing, even though this line would be the same. Uh, over here, the tires have obviously moved and something, over here. and this is the, the person, so their feet will move. Um, so in the, in the new screen, they will change. So they, they go through the analysis and then they, they um, they didn't say what algorithm they use, but essentially they figured out for the different A, B, and C, these are the best frames, right? And this is the residual. And right? obviously we can't see this in the in the in the display here. So these are the difference between these two images, right? So which essentially means that you are predicting this block goes to another block. You have the, the vector for it. And once you move it to the new location, you have to apply this difference because things change slightly. And if you look at here, it looks like it's completely black. But if you look on the, on the maybe on the printout or on the, on the uh, PowerPoint, you may be able to see a subtle, slight color color here. I don't know if you can see it in the back, right? So there's there's some difference, right? The key that you cannot see much is is the key because that means I can compress this very well because it's mostly black, right? So I can still make it look good. Um, so in this in the sense, the if you look at the I forget which one is the new one, which is the old, right? So essentially, for each of the blocks, the motion vector says where they are in the future, right? So A happens to be, have A didn't move, because the building did not move. But the other ones, they, you know, essentially, um, so I think the green is the old one and the red is the new one, right? So you, you, you say it moved from here to here. So you see that different blocks moved differently in different directions, right? So this one moved this way, this one moved this way, this one moved, up there, and the, the motion vector you're saying, so you're going to say this block motion vector is the vector which is this much uh, movement, this block this much movement, this block this much movement on, on the certain direction, and the difference between if you just move it and then that's what you're transmitting. Okay. Does, that, does that give a sense of what, 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 what is being done? Right. So, so that'll give us enough enough background to start looking at how some of the compression, media compression algorithms are, are, are designed. Um, and again, as we as we move forward, as the, as the standards move forward, you have more and more complex videos. So we are going to first look at H261, which is the, one of the compression algorithms. Uh, it's a standard. And it's, so H261, H264 is MP4, which is more of the modern uh, compression algorithm, right? So this was designed for video conferencing over ISDN networks, right? How many of you heard of ISDN network? Wow. I'm surprised because um, telephone companies fought really, 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 really hard to kill that technology, right? Even though it's supposed to be telephone technology. So where do you, do you use it for something? Or? I just heard of that. I don't okay. know anything about it. So ISDN is, is, was supposed to be the broadband before DSL and all came out, right? So ISDN was supposed to be something that the telephone companies could sell. To. I think it came up about in the 80s and stuff. So you can sell, they, they were able to sell it at increments of 64 kbps, right? So you can get 64 kbps, which is out of what you get for your for a home phone. And you can get 128 and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I say that they were trying to kill it really, really hard because when you, this is the days when there used to be dial-up, right? So people used to used to have dial-up, which is 55 or so, which is sort of like a kbps. So if you want it faster, you want it like a 128, uh, which is like two dial-up kind of thing. So the way the, 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 the telephone companies were charging was um, uh, uh, the ISDN at that rate, I think it was, when I checked in mid-90s, it used to be like $300 or something, right? Which clearly is kind of weird because you could get two home lines into your house and have two dial-up modems and you know pay like twenty dollars or something for your dial-up, so you get like forty dollars or whatever, maybe fifty, sixty or something, right? So they were they were selling it at this 
enormously pricey thing to get 128 kbps or what, what have you, right? So they, they really, really tried super hard to kill the technology. They finally killed it, then they realized that DSL came and, you know, the rest is history, right? So anyway, so one of the things that they wanted to do was be able to have video telephones. So if you look at any of the advertisements from 80s and 90s, right, the future they imagined was people would remove the phones and then replace them with the video phone, right? So um, if you look at the AT&T ads from back then, people would replace their, they imagined people would replace their phone with a video phone. So the technology was developed as a way for you to communicate over ISDN networks for video phones, right? So there are a lot of constraints that were put in place because it was designed to work over ISDN, right? And some of this, many other stuff is no longer true because people are not kind of stuck with the ISDN technology. But a lot of the technology that they use for the compression gets carried over because they, they, they turned out to be fairly good, right? So one of the aspects they had was it has to be multiples of 64 kbps, which means that the output has to be multiples of 64 kbps because that's sort of how ISDN was sold to you. So you either get 64 or 128 or whatever. So the compression has to create it in, in that ranges. And they also had a um, goal that the encoder has to be less than 150 millisecond. Again, this is supposed to be a video, a video phone. So 150 millisecond is, is deemed to be uh, um, when you notice that things were uh, off. Because you know, it, has to, it has to encode and transmit it over the wire so other person can see it and all, all those things. So those were set, right? So those two parameters were set. It has to be within. Um, 64 kbps, up to 30 times 64, but essentially multiples of that. And the encoder has to happen within 150 millisecond. And this was in late 80s and kind of stuff. So 150 millisecond was a lot more bigger deal for encoding than it is for many of the modern stuff, right? So you can imagine your, your iPhones and your phones are probably way more powerful than the computing that were available back in the days. So they they wanted to do SIF. Remember the, the SIF we kind of mentioned, the image size. They wanted to do SIF, but really they can only do QSIF, which is quarter of a SIF, right? But the, the dimensions for the luminance and uh, comments are here. It's, so essentially they're doing four is to two is to zero downsampling. So the luminance is QSIF and the comments is um, one fourth of that, which is 88 by 72. Right? And if it's if it's uncompressed, you'll you'll need 9.1 megabits per second. And obviously, you're trying to send it through 64 kbps. And the standard required this to be supported, and this was optional. SIF was optional. QSIF was, uh, QCIF has to be supported. I think they built few uh, video phones like this. And if my memory serves right, they cost like tens of thousands of dollars. Right? So many people couldn't afford $10,000 video phone uh, on their homes. But regardless, the, the, the technology that they developed was useful. So they introduced some, some ideas which we still hold on to. Um, one is the notion of the intra-frame and inter-frames, I versus P frames, right? And this is, this is uh, more of a modern concept. And then they also introduced the notion of macro blocks, where you have these blocks, but you kind of club them into larger group of blocks that you operate on, rather than just on a block, right? And you'll see why that is needed because you could, if you define your, so one option is to say, let's say this is the, you know, this is, this is the size of a block, right? So I can define this as four blocks, right? The notion here is, I may club these four into a concept of macro block, which is essentially a two by two uh, matrix of blocks, right? The the question is, why can't I just define my block to be that much bigger, right? The reason why you don't do that is when you do this downsampling, your luminance may be in a different size than your chrominance, right? So you want to make sure that all the computation happen at a, on a block size. So your luminance may be operating on four by four because it's, you remember it's um, four, two, zero, right? Your luminance is four times your chrominance values. So you make operate on four blocks, which you call the macro block. At the chrominance level, you only have to operate on one block, right? So you need the notion of something and one fourth of something because of this sampling, right? So they introduce the notion of a block and a macro block, a macro block and a block because because you, when you operate on different um, 
the luminance and chrominance, you need different uh, sizes, right? So all these algorithms work at least on the size of a block. For luminance, they operate on a macro block, which is basically four times, four, four blocks, right? So the, the main thing that they, they introduce, which sort of seems obvious um, at, at this point, is the notion of an intra I frame and a P frame. So what they do is they, the goal here is some of them are called I, some of them are called P, right? I, so you have multiple frames that you want to transmit, right? So I frame is the base frame, right? And then P frame is a predicted frame. So it essentially using this, you predict something about here, right? So you, you use this one and then you can do a motion vector and say, this frame is generated in software. So essentially you have to transmit this frame. And once you have this frame, this one is built based on here, right? It may be built as you take a copy of this and then you do all the motion vectors, defectors to see how they differ. So if this frame and this frame, things only changed, let's say around here, so essentially I can make a copy of the whole thing. Then something here will tell me which of the blocks have to be translated from somewhere through the motion, motion stuff and which are the differences I have to do. So I calculate this frame on the receiving end when I'm uh, decoding based on this frame, right? So I is the, is the, is the in, intra frame and P is the inter frame and P is forward predicted from the I frames. Does that make sense? This is a way of articulating what we were doing before. So the compression algorithm was predicting something from the past. So we have to say there are some frames which are, are independent by themselves. They, they, they don't depend on anything else. The predictive frames are dependent on this one. So when I'm transmitting this stuff, when I'm sending something to you, you know which frame is what. So you know that if I get I frame, that is, is, is it, it would, so you can, you can do whatever you want on the I frame to, to get compression within that I frame, because you, you can use a special, you can use a JPEG on, on the I frame, right? But the, J, the I frame would be as it is. When you receive it on the other end, it will be as it is. The P frames, you would have to have your prior, prior I frame and you're computing this on the fly. So when you're decoding this stuff, you need this frame to calculate the stuff, right? So it, it may happen that I can, um, I may have multiple P frames to generate the stuff, right? And at some point I may have another I frame, right? It need not happen like this. So you may be able to, instead of predicting from here to here, you may be able to predict like this, right? Basically predict this one based on here, right? In which case it may be like this, right? Which is based on the I frame, I predict this frame. And based on this frame, I predict this frame. And based on this frame, I predict this frame. And it, this may not exist, right? So there are complex ways of saying this stuff. Essentially, all of them are forward predicted. In the, fu in the future, we'll see how we can do backward prediction. The same idea, but uh, uh, um, so essentially you're, you're doing this stuff, right? So now that, so, the iframe here to just compress it like a JPEG or something, and then you're doing all this stuff, right? Can, so, can you get away with one iframe for the whole video? I, I had a, another iframe over there, right? Why would I have more than one iframe? Yeah. If you have a scene change, then most of the motion estimations would be very bad. Yeah, so. The, the, the scene may have changed such, such that, so ideally I would like the iframe to be the start of a new scene, right? So if I can know that, in many cases, it's, it's not as trivial as it sounds, but if I can know that, I can predict that this is a new scene and that's a new scene, right? So all the forward predictions for the next scene should be from the iframe, because otherwise you're gonna be, uh, you, you won't be able to predict because things change, right? And it may not be true all the time because scene changes, it's very hard to detect because scene change is not necessarily um, as clean as you want it to be, but that's one reason, right? Is that the only reason why you want the iframe to, um, a new iframe? Yeah? It would make the next couple predictions a lot easier. Um, so the prediction right after the iframe is gonna be a lot um, easier to do than a prediction mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. Th th that, that's an excellent point, right? So imagine if we have a uh, picture of the of the quad, right? Let's, let's, let's say we have a picture of the uh, of the dome, right? Uh, not not quad, just the dome. Assume there are no birds and stuff, right? So you're just looking at the dome, right? So nothing really changes for the most part, right? I mean, the dome is not moving, the camera is not moving. You're watching at the dome, right? So I can do a prediction where I can have this iframe as the first. So let's say in the morning, 8 o'clock, I start this stuff, right? And I can use that all the way till the evening, right? But even though I could use it all the way till the evening, right, the things do change. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's sunlight coming in and then, you know, evening changes and all those things. So there, there are shadows and stuff which are kind of changing. So if you have to predict all the way to, for a few few hours, even though things don't really change all that much, the computation may be kind of expensive, right? And, and so it may be good to kind of checkpoint at some point and say, I, you know, morning time, it's all fine, but when, when things radically change, I would like to have more iframes, right? So that's another reason why to have more iframes, right? So are there other reasons why you want to have more iframes? Think of this as a, as a transmission thing, right? So if, you, if you're transmitting this, um, how does iframe play a picture uh, role in, in how you view this stuff, right? Let's say this is this is how your TV is broadcast, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Would it help keep the quality at a certain level? Yeah, more more weirdly, if I come, so let's say this is being streamed, right? If I come in at this time, right? Can I watch the stream? I need this iframe, right? I can't, I can't, I can't do anything till the next iframe, right? The way so iframe is independent, right? It tells you all the all that it need, needed, and then all the prediction happens from that stuff. So if you start from the in the in the middle. P frame itself only predicts from what happened before. So unless you have the stuff, unless you have a way to get that back, right? So you may be able to get it back. You may be able to do it depending on the technology. So if you're talk, talking, like, let's say a DVD or something, you may be able to go back, right? So you may have noticed this if you're playing a DVD and stuff, right? You can't exactly stop and play from wherever you want it, right? If you if you say pass, it sort of would pass after a little bit, right? Because you can pause watching where you want, but you can't start playing from this frame, right? It has to start playing from here because iframe is the one where it starts processing, right? So if it's a TV being broadcast, if you're if you're look, again looking at the dome, if you're doing iframe one iframe in the morning and then nothing after that, right? Then if, if it, anybody who comes here would just be seeing P frames, so they they don't really get to see anything, right? So you want to have more iframes because you want robustness, right? So there are a number of reasons why you want different iframes. You want it because when there's scene change, if there's a lot of scene changes, you want iframes. And when there are no scene changes, you don't really need an iframe for the compression algorithm, except if it's like too long, right? Like take the example of a dome. But even within the, when there's nothing really changing, I would want to send iframe once in a while because otherwise um, you will, um, you won't be able to join the system, right? So th that's the challenge. So I have to figure out what si what now, how many, how often I should send this iframe, right? So, what's the reason why you would you wouldn't want to send lots of iframes? Would you want to send iframe every frame, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you if you send iframe every time, then it essentially becomes a motion JPEG or something. I mean, you're doing JPEG every time, and then you lose all the stuff, right? So the the trying to figure out where this number should be is an art, right? Uh, it's not a well understood art, and it's it's mostly happens based on image analysis, right? So when you're doing a project, you'll notice that systems will ask you how often do you want the iframe, right? They don't ask you about where the P and, and most of the modern ones have also have a, a thing called B, which is bi-directional prediction. We'll see in the future, right? So essentially, they don't care about how much this stuff, but they want to know how often you want to have it, right? 
So it's simple to say you should have iframe every so often, every 30 frames or, or what have you, right? But what you really want is the, the stuff we discussed. What you really want is whenever there's a scene change, I should have iframe. And otherwise, I should see how far ahead you have gone to, to intelligently decide where things should happen, right? And that is very computation intensive. And that's one of the reasons why the, the thing I was talking about takes that much time. Even though in this particular case, the only thing which is moving is me on the screen, you, the, the computation algorithm is very hard to figure out where the scene changes and where to put that iframe, right? And you want a good balance because if you don't, then, so iframe tends to be, let's say about 20, 20 times as much as these frames, right? Again, it depends on what you're trying to see, right? So if you, if this happens to be able to be able to predictable, so if, if, if I'm looking at the dome, right, you can you can possibly have this as zero x, right? Because the p basically says the dome is where it is and nothing changed, and so on and so forth. So you send the iframe, nothing else happens after this at all. Whereas if things are moving, depending on how much they're moving, you expect this to be a different size. And at some point, you may decide that if this and this have sufficiently changed enough that the if the, if the P frame happens to be, say, 15x, right, because there's so much motion from the previous one, you may decide to say, well, I don't want this. I just want to send the, the whole P frame because it's, it's changing so much, so let me send the whole thing up, right? So that's, that's a judgment call from you. So depending on how these scenes are, things are playing out, this will always be big, right? Because this is this is compressing the whole image. This one can be can be variable, right? You don't want it to be go to ever go more than 20x, right? So if the prediction happens to be that the prediction is like 40x size, right? Then clearly you don't want this. You just want a new iframe, and and that's a challenge, right? Thinking of how what this means for our transmission, right? Our, our transmission or, or what you do with the systems, right? So once you do this compression, even though I talk about I frames and P frames, when you're transmitting it on the ISDN line, right? I may talk about it as every 130th of a second, I want to send a frame because, you know, I, I expect you to show 30 frames per second, so that's what I expect, right? But what would that mean for on the wire? You need 30 frames per second, right? So I have 30 frames here, right? And let's let's say for 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 um, ease of description, I have one i and I have 29 p's, right? Right. And again for ease, let's say that this one takes 20 x and this one each one is like 0.5 x or something, right? Some small number, right? You need, to, you need to make sure that they all add up to one, right? So, so some some small thing like this, right? So, how would this be? How, how would this be on the wire, right? The iframe being the bulk of this stuff within the one second, it's going to take most of the the bandwidth, right? The p frames tend to be small because they just add something to the previous one, right? So in terms of transmission, so life was good if I can say, I'm going to send 30 frames per second, so you're gonna get one packet, network packet, every uh, one thirtieth of a second, which you can use it to show it on the screen. But the reality is, you're going to see frames which are pretty big and are very important, right? You can't mess with the iframe, right? You can you can lose a p-frame, and we'll, we'll see as we move along. You can lose a p-frame, because if you lose a p-frame, you lose some prediction, right? And depending on what the prediction is, you may lose that particular frame, right? So in this particular case, I had, you know, from iframe, you predict this one, right? And then you predict this one. And this frame was predicted from here, right? In this particular case, if I don't receive this, right? Then all that will happen is, I will have frame one, frame two. I won't be able to show frame three to you because I didn't get, get this information. But I can, I can show frame four because it was being predicted from here, right? If I lose this, then I would lose a certain number of frames, depending on how, how, much, how, how much forward the, the information goes, up, goes forward. But if I lose this i, all this is lost, right? And so, that plays a big role in all the stuff we, we are going to say. This is the reason why we are going through all this stuff, which is 
even though we think of video as as a big object it's not a big ob i mean it's a, it is a big object the compressed arm image is a big object but it has structure which has this weird property that there are some frames which are very important and they tend to be big and you you cannot mess with them you cannot drop them there are other frames which can be dropped right and depending on how lucky you are the effects may be sort of localized right and if if you don't have enough bandwidth the, the the question is if i don't have enough bandwidth which frame should i drop right if i have no bandwidth at all your answer cannot be i'm going to drop the i frame and get all the p frames because they're no use to you right so you, you have to keep the i frame but within the p frame you you want to choose the p frames which cause the least amount of damage right so you're trying to find out which frames to 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 be sent to you and all those things so that those add add complexity those add complexity in terms of how to transmit them how to store them how to act with them and you know once you get these frames you have to do certain amount of computation to get these things going and, and that that's a challenge right and 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 in real life you have ip and b frame and, and more complex stuff right so anyway so going back to the the stuff so they introduce a notion of i frame and a p frame which essentially uh, quantifies the notion of a uh, fixed frame and the motion vector prediction kind of stuff right so they have you know the the sort of like the graph i had here so i frames and and p frames and uh, the standard does not define how many p frames should be there how many i frames should be there and again that's the, the that's the stuff you are trying to figure out uh, and a good number of how how much these should be um so i i frame is it's 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 not it's no big deal you know you can do whatever you want um you pretty much use something like a jpeg compression right so since we deal with the macro block of size 4 by 4 right which is um which is essentially four macro blocks in the on the lo uh, luminous domain like so the if you take the image and do the, the ycbcr right why would be four over there on, on the corner right why would be four blocks cb and cr would be one block you generate the macro blocks for them right and then you can do your usual dct and quantization and um entropy coding right the 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 way you do for your for your jpeg the only difference is at least in h261 they didn't have the luxury of having the matrices and stuff to do the quantization so they simply divided everything by 8 and then simply uh, multiply by 8 right so they are dropping all frequencies equally and modern uh, encoders you won't do that i mean um they choose some number and use it on all the thing i think for the for the dct they drop it by 8 for the uh, ac components they they use a different range from 1 to 31 so essentially they drop all the frequencies except dct at, at, at a different pace but but the idea is it, it's no it's not that different from jpeg right and this they had to do because of the of the hardware they had the the catch is you have to figure out the the, the interframe the the p frames right so the p frame again you have to so they only define the p to be plus or minus 15 pixels so from wherever you are the p is defined to be uh, only that that big right so you, you know you don't have to search the whole frame so you take the reference frame and the target frame you do the um, you you figure you know you you figure out what the you figure out what's the best match right so essentially you you, you do whatever you do the logarithmic or se sequential or something to figure out where it is in the reference frame and then once you figure out this is the best match you look at the difference right you look at the difference between that and the and the and the original uh, and the one that you're trying to transmit if the difference is too much right so you, you do a you, you look you have the difference like yeah, uh, blocks right if the difference is too much means there's too much color then you may decide that this cannot be really a, uh, something that you you want to look at right but the difference is not too to if if it's okay then you encode the difference right so you encode the difference between the the previous you know from the block from the target and the block from the reference frame translated right and hopefully if like like we saw in the uh, on the illustration it's all black which means it's all mostly zeros which means that there's a lot of uh, same numbers so this would compress much nicely right and you also do the the motion vectors as a difference right the the other observation here is things tend to move in the same direction throughout the scene right even though on the example we saw they were not the case but in general if somebody is moving then the whole bunch of blocks which are around them which is going to move in the same direction so the motion vectors for all of them would all be pointing to the same way 
So rather than sending the motion vectors as by themselves, I'm going to do a difference of those. So I only send the difference from the previous motion vector, right? Which I expect to be zero because all it's saying is this particular human being is walking this way, so the motion vector of all of them is the same, essentially pointing this way, right? So again, I do this stuff to get more zeros. That means I get better compression, right? So, um, so and, 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 the, and the last one is sometimes after doing all this stuff, you realize that the, the new version you get is actually bigger than what would have happened if you just transmitted without any kind of stuff. So in that case, you have to send it as, um, it's sort of like iframe. So you, you basically say, I, I try to predict the future, but the fu future frame, it takes more more space for me to transmit than the than, than me sending the iframe itself. So I call it uh, non-compensated -compa frame, which is essentially sort of iframe, right? Um, and we'll stop with this. So essentially, when you send it as a stream, you, you actually have a group of blocks, and we'll see, come to this notion uh, much higher, much later. So they have a notion of a, they, they group these blocks into higher and higher blocks and, and store them in this notion, th this fashion. And we'll see how this actually helps when you go to MPEG-4 and all those things later on. But essentially the idea here is you, you, you want to get some sort of macro structure out of these videos. So um, dealing with them and, and being able to drop them is easier. Right? And that's one of the things that we, we worry about a lot in these kind of systems. I'll see you on Friday.